Chris came to consciousness with a shock. An immense burning breath rasped into his lungs, dragging nails and razor blades through his throat. The weight of the world pressed down upon his chest. Every muscle felt bruised. Every joint felt rusted. His kidneys punched and testicles squeezed. Nausea roiled in his gut. His eyelids were lined with sandpaper, and like rocks in a doorway, mucus encrusted and propped them open. His sinuses were entirely occluded, forcing him to breathe through his raw, sensitive mouth. His vision was all muddled darkness, his hearing cottony tinnitus, like lying at the bottom of a muddy lake. Floaters flew past like no seums. Pressure crushed against his ears. They had said the transit would be unpleasant, but they had never given specifics. The truth was likely that they didn't know. Cocooned in this pain, Chris tried to seek refuge in thoughts of his sister and of his friends at the center. The memories he could latch onto helped a little in focusing him, but the pain was persistent, like aspirin when he needed morphine. He imagined worse pain, breaking a bone, a car crash, a lost loved one, his last sunset on the dock. His mouth watered and his eyes seeped. He hoped the warmth spreading in his groin was piss and not blood. The gauntlet he had passed through eventually reached its end. All his cells and tissues realigned and his body began to return to him. As his eyesight stabilized, the dark haze transitioning into a light one, Chris ventured a glance through his tears. He could just barely identify the tall silhouettes of trees at the edge of the clearing and the lesser swaying waves of grass stalks nearby. The sound of the breeze swimming through the glade and the soft trill of birds dancing in the bordering bushes incrementally replaced the tinny buzzing in his ears. Chris tentatively rolled from his back to his belly. His cheek rested in the dirt. His breath puffed up dust and chafe and set him to coughing. He rested for a count of a hundred before trying to push up to his knees. His first couple of attempts ended in failure, but perseverance brought success. He racked back and sat back on his heels. For an unstable moment, Chris thought his momentum was going to continue taking him back and he would wind up in the dirt again. But like a toddler on the verge of toppling, he was able to steady himself and prevent the fall. Small miracles, big victories. Rest, hands on thighs, head tilted back, breathing deeply, more controlled and less painfully. His sight was nearly restored. There was still no depth and colors seemed confused, but everything was so bright. Chris rubbed the heels of his hands into his sockets. It felt raw and sublime. When he reopened his eyes, he saw the coppice of trees standing before him like sentinels. Brown needles carpeted the ground around their trunks. Myriad long reaching brambles and grasses sprouted up across the glade, up to the edge of an acidified ground. Not trusting his balance fully, Chris gingerly looked over his shoulder and found an adjacent thicket of leafy trees, maple, beech, growing behind him. A wider stretch of tree line lay further beyond and downhill. The air tasted of sap and wild onions. He tried breathing through his nose, blocked tight. Chris inhaled deeply through his mouth and holding one nostril at a time forcefully blew out. A concoction of infernal detritus burst from his nostrils and splashed into the soil before him. The pressure in his sinuses and ears popped painfully, setting his eyes watering even more than before. His ears crackling as they sought equilibrium. Chris took in his first true breath of the forest. Smell was the leading sense to fully return following his temptation. The trainers at the center had explained the air would smell and feel thinner and lighter, less burnt, but he had taken it for granted how complex and rich the difference he had encountered. His tongue had already detected the nearby pines, but now he could distinguish a variety of sweeter smells which he knew came from the various wildflowers in the grove. Earthy odors, dirt, mold, decay, and the slight bite of fresh feces also accompanied the plant fragrances. That smells so good, 
he said to the open field, as though complimenting a chef. His voice sounded gravelly, tubercular, like a lifetime smoker. The contrast to the air from home, what had always been home, struck him, and he found himself feeling maudlin. Anna filled his mind as he knew she would. The center's motto, concern of the past is hope for the future, was carved above the entrance. Someone had spray painted a smiley face next to the exclamation point, and though there had been a half-hearted attempt to remove it, the graffiti remained defiantly visible. Chris stepped up to the glass reception desk. Behind sat a fair-complexioned young woman typing on the keyboard embedded into the desk. She had fiery red hair spilling over her shoulders. A navy hairband was wrapped around her wrist. Her blouse and skirt were in the center's color motif, navy blue and orange. She looked a lot like a majorette. Welcome to the Center for Social and Environmental Advancement, she cheerfully greeted him, where our past becomes our future. She handed Chris a data pad and instructed him to type his name and press his thumbprint onto the sensor at the top right corner. He noted that he was the 24th of his cohort's 50 recruits to have arrived. Top half, he thought. The receptionist caught his smile and returned it in kind as she presented him with the next week's schedule. He noticed that her irises were Irish green, but the sclera were roomy, suggesting illness. The gums around her bright white teeth a little too red. Disconcerted, he shifted his gaze to the collection of papers in her hand. These are the directions to the dormitory. Her tone changed, became suddenly formal. She was probably familiar with people noticing her condition, whatever it may have been. You will find your quarters in the dining facility there. Tonight, you will meet your roommates and section instructors. He thanked her and passed through the reception area toward the shuttle station. The ride and subsequent walk to the dorms were farther than he had expected. The campus, if one could call it that, was a retrofitted airport, still containing tarmac, tower, maintenance hangars, and terminal now with the additional administration building where he had reported. The airport had been one of many closed due to consolidation. With fossil fuel prices skyrocketing into astronomical territory, most interstate travel was conducted via high-speed maglev rails Though a few of the larger central hubs remained following the transportation downsize, most of the surviving airports were positioned in the extreme eastern and western states. Air travel between adjacent states was limited to the wealthy who could afford the shorter hops. The general public only flew when international or bi-coastal travel was absolutely necessary. Campus access had been altered from its original design. The main entrance now lay at the end of the runway rather than near its center. A side road snaked toward the parking garage next to the terminal, but it was only open to cleared staff. A high-level security identification card was required for entry. The sleeping quarters and classrooms were kept in what once was the terminal. Ten repurposed hangars served as field instruction sites. Each cohort had their own assigned hangar each one covered in years of class insignias, mottos, and typical inane shout-outs. The tower remained a tower. Chris stepped from the shuttle with five other recruits and approached the terminal building. An automated sign flashing instructions, directions, and the ubiquitous weather and air quality reports greeted the group. Chris noted the barometric pressure was low and a front was on its way. Rain was forecasted. Air quality hovered in the upper yellows, just below dangerous potential, and everyone was advised to remain indoors as much as possible. If unable to be inside, seek cover once the expected rain began. The warning felt redundant. He found his name and room assignment on the display, but even with the color-coded directional arrows along the walls, it took nearly half an hour to find his quarters. The room was a 12 foot by 12 foot box set up for four occupants. In each corner sat a simple metal framed bed, a prefab nightstand and lamp 
perched at the head. Someone had already claimed the bed in the far right corner, which made sense since Chris was 2450. The early bird had taken the one spot away from both the entryway and the bathroom door on the left wall of the room. Good choice, Chris said to the bag slumped on the mattress against the head wall. Chris laid his own duffel on the bed to the right of the entrance, but still away from the bathroom since he figured it would be the second least likely to get disturbed during the night. Before he had opened his bag, a woman a few years younger than he stepped into the room. She toted a small blue hiking pack over her right shoulder. Seeing the bag in the far corner, she muttered, Top choice. Chris grunted his agreement, causing her to flinch in surprise. Jeez, she cried. Creep much? Sorry, Chris said sheepishly. I didn't mean to. It's all right. You must have been in my blind spot. I've got to check my side mirrors better, I guess. Have you been here long? Chris shook his head and returned to his unpacking. I just got here, too. Missed it by moments, did we? She stood looking at the two remaining beds, making a mental coin flip. Oh, well, if I can't have the best, might as well have the worst. She shrugged off her pack and laid it on the bed to the left of the door and then went into the bathroom. Chris hadn't brought much with him. His recruiter advised him more than a change of clothes, toiletries, and a few sentimental items, which for him consisted of a half dozen actual books. He put the clothes into the bottom two drawers of his nightstand, the toiletries into the top drawer. He considered hiding the books for fear of theft, but resigned himself to the possibility and instead stacked them in plain sight on top of the stand. He pushed his bag under the bed with his foot as the woman reemerged from the bathroom. Communal bathroom, but at least there are locks on the stalls, she said. What's your name? Chris, he said. Hi, Chris. I'm Anna. She reached over to shake his hand. A pause as their hands clasped. Each bent forward, almost bowing like the opening of a dance. Anna's eyes sparkled with specks of jade, gold, and humor. She stepped toward him, not letting go of his hand. Have we met? Um, I don't believe so, Chris said. Hmm. She squinted slightly, inspecting him, then released her grip and returned to her corner. Damn it! A broad-shouldered guy burst into the room like a bullet. The last one! He carried nothing but a toothbrush and a tube of toothpaste. Welcome, Chris said. Jesus! The new guy twisted to see Chris. I didn't see you. Are you a sniper? He went stomping over to the remaining bed and dropped his toothbrush and toothpaste onto the pillow. He does that, Anna said from her bed. Oh! A girl, he said, taking notice of Anna. The rooms are co-ed? Apparently so. What's your name? The man asked. Is it a boyish girl or a girly boy name like Chris? Something they could have mixed up? No, that's Chris, she indicated Chris sitting on his mattress. I'm Anna. Hi, Anna. Hi, Chris. He crossed over to each of them and turned to shake their hands. Sorry about that, dude. I'm Ian Fredericks. Ian used his whole body in greeting. Anna received a two-handed handshake while Chris got a handshake with shoulder squeeze. An awkward silence followed. Ian stood in the middle of the room, rocking on his heels. Quick question, Ian, Anna said to break the moment. Shoot. How did you know you were the last person to get a bunk, but didn't see either of us here? She pulled her pack over between her feet and began to release the top straps. Funny story, actually, Ian began. I notice things, like details and differences, better than people. It's weird, I know. Fair enough, Anna responded. Either of you snore? Ian asked, pivoting between them. She does, Chris motioned to Anna. Anna squatted over her ruck, and craned her face around to look at him. You sure we haven't met? She winked at him. 
Ian looked back and forth for a beat. His eyes narrowed in suspicion. Okay, then. He brought his hands together like a strike of thunder. I'm off to find food. You two creepy conspirators care to join me? They both agreed. Anna shoved her pack under her bed, and the three set out. In the dining facility, they met their fourth roommate, Marcus. Ian spotted him from across the busy room. He introduced Chris and Anna as long-lost twins. Marcus asked how Ian had known to approach him. All the four seated tables are filled. You're alone. We're missing one. I asked, and you confirmed. I may be big and dumb, but I'm not stupid. Just loud, Anna added. Ian turned to Chris and Anna and said, See? Thanks. This should be interesting, Chris said. 